Hi, I'm Jim Crawford, CEO of JC Law, and welcome to our podcast. Uh, Tyler is here producing the podcast. Tyler, how you doing? Good, good. We're going to have a little bit of fun today, and I wanted to basically talk to people about what they should do when they're picking a lawyer. Uh, you know, I, I recently had some experiences where some friends were asking me, um, about that, and it was an, happened to be an area of the law, Tyler, that we don't do something totally different. He said, well, how the hell do I choose to do what we're talking about? And I gave him some thoughts and some ideas, and uh, and I jotted some notes down that I thought might help people, and I'm going to be very succinct, and we'll, this won't be one of the longest uh, podcasts that we have, but I think it's, it's important. So what are the top five things that you should not do, a little bit of a twist, not do when you're picking a lawyer. Okay, let's start with number one. Number one, do not go with the first lawyer. Simple as that. Okay, if you go with the first lawyer, you're kind of stuck. You have no idea what else is out there. You have to do some interviews, even if it's over the phone, even if it is part of like a video conference or in person. I encourage in person. It takes time. But you know, we all want to hi- we all want to you know do things quickly in today's world. Just hire them and see what happens or what have you. No, you need to have somebody that's going to do what you need them to do, especially if it's a divorce scenario or a criminal scenario or a civil litigation scenario. So don't go with the first one, okay? Chances are you will never go with the first one. Uh, if you don't pick anybody else or, or if you don't interview anybody else, then you will be stuck. So don't go with the first one. And when you go to be interviewed, let them explain to you why they – are the best choice for you. Uh, let them explain that. Don't try to you know somehow or another put in your brain like, oh, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. No, let them express it. Don't assume they're going to do something if they don't tell you. So, guys, don't go with the first lawyer. Usually, if you, if you happen to check out two or three or four and go back to the first one, then fine. Okay? Second, don't pick a lawyer because you're scared. Okay, that's a very, very normal occurrence. I'm going to let people know a little secret. You know what a lot of lawyers do, Tyler, as far as um, selling and, inter- and, and, and uh, talking to people about interviewing about their cases? They know people are scared. And I can't stand that. I can't stand that. I think that's the wrong way to do it. I remember lawyers years ago, the first thing they would say to somebody who's charged with a crime, they'd say, you know, you're looking at potentially 10 years in jail. When I, you know, if I looked at the case, they're not going to jail, most likely. They're not going to. You've got to be honest with the client, but don't try to scare them, okay? Don't pick somebody simply because you're scared. You need to choose a lawyer, um, you know, based on a lot of other factors, okay? Here's a couple factors that I'm going to throw out. Experience. Listen, the bottom line, too, is that how much experience does the lawyer have? It, it plays a part. You're not going to go to a heart surgeon who's going to be uh, in a situation where this is your first solo ride, where you're, you're the first patient. Now, I'm not discounting young lawyers or other lawyers who don't have a lot of experience. They could be better than ones that have experience. But it's got to be taken into consideration, okay? And it's not just the experience that they have. It's about the court system that they're in. Are they in federal court? or in a particular county, or are they in a scenario that they know everybody around them? So experience plays a big part. Here's something else as on number two. Support and backup. A lawyer cannot really effectively do what they should be doing if they don't have an L.A., don't have a secretary, don't have, um, you know, a uh, uh, other lawyers, uh, clerks, things like that. Now, that doesn't mean they have to have all of them. But they need backup of some sort, okay? When you call the office and the lawyer is in court all day long, who are you going to talk to? Are you going to leave a message say, please call me? Or are you going to talk to the L.A. that basically says, oh, Mr. Crawford, how are you? Listen, uh, Tom is in court today. He'll be back later on. And we're in a situation where um, uh, at least someone knows you called. Following up with support and backup, okay? So you need to have and make sure that your lawyer has other people you can talk to. A team is great, okay? A team is great. Another issue under number two is, what is the policy of them keeping you updated? One of the things I can't stand 
as a lawyer is when clients tell me that other lawyers don't communicate with them. We all think we're smart lawyers. The reality is we're not that smart in the scheme of things. I mean, there's uh, don't get me wrong, I don't have a lot of lawyers mad at me now. But th we're smart, okay, maybe not me, but others. But the point is that we all think that the client knows what we know. And they don't. You've got to have a good bedside matter. You've got to speak to people. And so you've got to ask them, okay, what is your policy in keeping me updated? I don't want to just figure it out as I go along. Okay, I don't want to you know, call you three days later and say, what's going on? And then you do that over and over again. That lawyer gets upset because nothing's happening, but you keep calling and bothering them. Lawyers are their own worst enemy. Understand that. This is what you say to the lawyer. Listen, how often are we going to communicate? How are we going to communicate? When do you want me to communicate? And here's a little secret. Under our perfect client life cycle, every lawyer should use this. Most don't. But under the perfect client life cycle, under the different stages of litigation, you're going to communicate more at times and less than others. I do it by, like, I, I look at it as like a baseball game, innings. Inning one, Tyler, you come to me and you say, I am really, I need help, blah, 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 and we're both excited. You retain me, you pay me money, okay? It's inning number one, and you want to try to do this and do that, and we talk. Well, not a whole lot's going to happen in inning number one, two, and three, unless there's some things happening behind the scenes. In other words, trying to, maybe your ex took the kids, you may have to file an emergency petition. But chances are, in many cases, there's going to be times when nothing's happening. So usually by the third, fourth, or fifth inning, you, the client, are saying, Jim, I've paid you this money and nothing's happening. What's going on? Okay? You have to get, have an understanding with your lawyer about this. How are you going to keep me updated? How are you going to tell me what's going on? Are you going to give me regular emails? Are you going to text me? Are you going to have me come in once a week? Are you going to let me talk to your LA? Just give me something. Don't assume that... It's just going to fall into place. And it's, listen, I, I make it tantamount to dating. If you're thinking about marrying someone, don't you think you should talk about, do you want to have children? You know, what is your role going to be? you got to lay these things out, and it's got to be talked about. So policy and keeping you updated. Another part under, um, on, uh, of this under number two is the cost. What are you charging me? How much and what and who charges me? Do your LAs charge me? Do your clerks charge me? Do the other lawyers charge me? How many people are going to have their hands in my file? Is this a complicated case? Is this something not too complicated? Can you tell me where we're going to end up? Give me an idea at least. It's very, very important. The next factor, number two, is the success factor. Stop bullshitting me, lawyer. Tell me where I am. Am I going to be successful here? Am I not going to be? And the standard answer is going to be, well, I can't really tell you this and that. But you know what? Lawyers a lot of times can tell you. They ought to be able to give you a pretty good in-depth idea about what your chances are. If you're in a particular court, these particular judges are leaning this way. If it's grandparent rights versus a, you know, a third-party right to a child in custody, if it's a marital issue, if it's marital property, we ought to be able to give you an idea, okay? So you ought to have some idea about success. But here's the problem, okay, as a lawyer and a client. If I talk to you when you are hypersensitive about, you know, and hyper-focused on trying to achieve something, if I tell you A, B, and C, by the sixth inning, A, B, and C is turned into E, F, G. Because in your mind, you are thinking that this is terrible, I need something to be done here. So it's the lawyer's job to continue to say, no, Tyler, A, B, C, A, B, C. This is what we're doing, okay? That's where we need to be. Following through with number two, I would say, hey, guys, you, know, I want, you want me to hire you. Do you have any awards, any notoriety? Did you write any books? Did you do this? What, what makes you different than 5,000 other lawyers out there um, are you involved in a bar association? Do you deal with the judges? Is, is, uh, this, do you have a, a different thought process? And that's something that you need to ask the lawyer. Okay, all right, let's move on to number three. Guys, don't be intimidated or swayed by the surroundings of a lawyer. Okay, don't be intimidated from the standpoint that you walk in, it's glitz and glamour, and somehow or another, well, this person must know what they're doing because they have a great office. And on the other hand, the other way 
it works too. Don't assume because the lawyer doesn't have, you know, golden tables or chandeliers that they're not good lawyers. Okay, a lot of lawyers, that's not really that important. And I get that. It's it's about practicing law and doing what they need to do for their clients. So don't be intimidated by that. That's number three. Okay, let's move on to number four. And I'm going to say to you, don't pick your lawyer because it's easier just to get it done. And that kind of goes with number one as far as picking the first one. But, you know, it's going to take you a minute to hire a lawyer. Okay, number one, two, three, four, five picks. And it's not just about money. Okay, you have to really think about the relationship. Let's talk about that for, for a minute. So number four is don't pick because it's simply easier to get the lawyer and get it done and what have you. That's not necessarily the way to go here. So you got to make sure you're on the same page as the lawyer. And it, the consultation is going to take a minute or two. Is it a free consultation? Is it a paid consultation? At the firm here, we always give free consultations, except in unusual situations. Uh, the reason we do that is because I really think it's a service to the community. I mean, you know, you can't have somebody go out and pay five lawyers for a consultation. They can't do it. They're going to pay, they're end up paying most of the fee that they need. So a reasonable consultation is really important before they hire you. So one of the first things you need to ask is going back to what I talked about. What is the game plan here? What are we going to do? How do I accomplish this? What is the game plan? Okay. How long is it going to take? Just tell me. I mean, you have an idea. I mean, it's not, this is not a hidden state secret. You know, you know, custody cases can take six months. They can take three months. They can take a year and a half. They can take longer. It just depends upon the situation. Number th- C under number four, explain the law. Tell me what I'm looking at. Am I, do I have an uphill battle or am I on a level playing field or does my opponent or my other, the other side have an uphill battle? Please explain the statutes and the case law. And I'll repeat that. Tell me the statutes and the case law. And if your lawyer can't rip off some information, some law about what's going on right in front of you, um, thank you very much. I'm moving on to the next. Come on, this is what we do. Okay, it's like asking a doctor what kind of medicine you take for a common cold. They should know what the hell's going on as far as the at least the basic law and the statutory and case law schemes. Lawyer, what normally occurs here? Tell me what happens in most custody cases in this situation. They can't, they can't put you in a situation where they're going to be able to tell you 100% of everything, but what normally occurs? And, you know, what is the realistic chances of me accomplishing what I want? I don't want to hear from the lawyer, we're going to go kill him, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. Well, yeah, that's great, and sometimes you need to have that game plan, but you also need to be realistic about what's going on here. Okay, if you're not the, the father or parent of a child and you haven't seen the child in decades or a long time, I'm being silly, but you have less of a chance of success. So what are the realistic chances of winning? Okay, is a lawyer just giving you lip service? Blah, 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 Tyler. Yes, 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 yes. Now here's a sign. Give me some money. Have a nice day. Okay, you got to look at that to see what's going on there. Okay, you got to look at it. Back to what I was talking about earlier and get into more specifics. What is the communication schedule? That's important because lawyers feel like, thank you very much. I bent over backwards to get you to sign. Now I don't need to talk to you for two months. It doesn't work like that. But on the other hand, a lawyer needs to tell you as the client what's going on and how you're going to communicate. I make it a practice and I teach my lawyers You've got to tell people how, when, and where. And if the client oversteps that and doesn't do what the game plan is, you've got to tell the client, don't call me on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock just to see what's going on. Now, there's part, you know, inaccuracy on both parts there because if the lawyer had kept up with the normal schedule, the client wouldn't be calling at that time. All right, moving on. Okay, what is the ultimate cost? And what I mean by that is, okay, I'm paying you X amount of dollars, lawyer. Okay, what do the experts cost? What are other fees? What are you charging for LAs or what have you? So don't be in a situation where you don't ask these questions. Okay, because if you don't, you're going to be stuck and you'll be in a situation 
where um, you, you may regret it and you may be looking for another lawyer. Just as a side note, what I always preach to my lawyers and to everyone is that under our philosophy, our perfect client life cycle, we have to talk to clients innings one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we keep people up to date as far as what's going on there. So it's very, very important. All right, let's move on to number five. Is your lawyer a paper pusher or a dragon? And if you don't ask these questions, you're not going to know. Because if your lawyer is simply a paper pusher, all of a sudden it's the fourth inning, fifth inning, months have gone by, nothing's happened, but they've done a damn good job of following pleadings. If, on the other hand, if they're super aggressive, okay, and they're in a situation where they're going to do very well in court, but they don't follow the necessary pleadings, then you're out there too. You need a good balance. You need someone who has the ability to follow the necessary pleadings, drive your case, and take you where you need to be, but also someone who's not afraid to step into the courtroom and slay some dragons, okay? That's very, very important. Another aspect that you cannot ignore is the actual approach that your lawyer is going to take. So, Tyler, if you come to me and you have a semi-complex case and it's going to cost you a couple of dollars, what you need to ask me is, can we work this out? Okay, we're both reasonable people, meaning me and the other side. Can we work it out? You don't want a lawyer that says, no, 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 I'm going to charge you and we're going to go down to the third, fourth, fifth inning before we even start talking. No, what you need to do is your lawyer needs to, in the first inning, second inning, reach out and try to communicate with the opposing party to try to work it out. So you don't want to just be aggressive for aggressive sake. Next thing you know, you've wasted a lot of money and you had, whereas it could have been worked out a long time ago, okay? Next is this, it's still under this mantra, and that is you have to develop a relationship with your lawyer. They can't be afraid of you asking questions. They can't be afraid of you challenging them. They can't be afraid of telling the truth about what you want to hear or not hear. Okay, so many times I tell clients, you're not going to like this, but this is where we are. Or you know what, you're going to like this, and this is where we can be. So you need to develop that relationship. I think from a lawyer perspective, I preach and preach and preach to the people that work here and other lawyers in the community. You have to develop a relationship. That's a very broad term, but if you don't have that relationship, Tyler, you're not going to be able to do what needs to be done, okay? Does the lawyer have a billing department, okay? Are you communicating with the billing department? Is the lawyer sitting there at night doing their own billing, okay? Are they charging you for billing? A lot of little hidden things. In other words, they charge you to actually do the bill itself, okay? So if you don't do these things and these factors, you're going to be less likely to be successful because, guys, let me tell you something. Half the battle in winning whatever battle you're fighting as far as custody, divorce, is guess what? Is finding the right lawyer to do the job. It's not like simply going to get gas at a different gas station. You need to find the right lawyer. And I would even go so far as to say to people that, you know what, listen, it's on you. If you don't find the right lawyer, that lawyer's not communicating to you and expressing to you what they need to do, then they're not, they're not going to do it later on either. If they're not able to do that in the initial meeting or at least initial first few meetings, then how the hell are they going to be able to do that in front of a judge? They have to articulate, speak. They've got to have a little bit of personality. They have to be in a situation where they can convince other people that what you desire is what is appropriate in the case, at least most of it. This is not a paper-pushing business. We are a personal service business. Some of the best lawyers ever, the Clarence Darrows in this country, are ones that could communicate. Sometimes communicate means saying no. Sometimes it says, you're damn right, we have to go after that. So... No lawyer is perfect. You will be frustrated with your lawyer. It happens. But the lawyer has to be ever vigilant in leading you and driving you. If they're not doing that, then they're not successful in what they're doing. There's success in the end result, and there's success in the litigation itself. Let's face it, under the perfect client life cycle, people don't have millions of dollars to spend on litigation. 
They just don't, especially in family law scenarios. Civil litigation, we do a lot of business, is a little bit different, but not really. So you need to, as a lawyer, extend yourself. If you don't do these factors, you're not going to be successful in picking and choosing the right lawyer. So that's it. Over and out. Make sure we do this, and I'll see you guys next time.